I always start off with a bang. Why not with this? Hello, everybody. I'm here because I have these little tiny ears and they figured I could wear this better than anyone. No, the truth is I'm here today because I do live on the ADHD spectrum and all a spectrum means is think of a fancy rainbow and take away the color. And what I really want to talk to you about today is something much more important. Now, I'm often known for those who know me, she mentioned a TV show or a charity or whatever it is, but most people know me because I'm a thorn in their side. I like to think it's the good kind of thorn, but I'm not sure everyone would agree. So I wanted to mention to you a little bit about the ADHD equation, but specifically in the context of is super hyper, in today's fast-paced world, a new superpower? And we're going to discuss that. But in order to do that, we have to really talk about where I began. The first thing I did when I heard that I was going to be speaking at a TEDx event was I read and I looked at some of the other TEDx videos and content, and frankly, I was intimidated. I mean, there's some pretty incredible speakers. Then I thought, well, you know, I know a lot of people who've been involved in TEDx events, from Jerusalem all the way to Vancouver, and they had the longest list of do's and don'ts Needless to say, I was a little freaked out. Okay. I freak out easy, but that one really got me. Then I thought, well, maybe I could channel that inner Oprah, you know? Start focusing on those aha moments. <laughs> Except my aha moments kept coming out, uh-oh. And that's not surprising. My mother would tell you I'm a terrible pessimist. But the truth is, I was starting to run out of inspiration. And like any good, red-blooded young woman who happens to be the youngest of five kids, I asked my mother... Now, my mother does live with disability. So I said to her, I said, Mom, what do you think about disability? And this is what she said. I'll tell you what she said, because that's what's going on. What she says is, in her own beautiful way, with her Servox, because she lost her voice box to cancer, she says, I don't consider myself as having a disability. I consider it a pain in the ass. And although it sounded better when she said it through the Servox, it didn't really help either way. So what I had to really focus on was genuinely my perspective. My perspective, growing up in a family, as I mentioned, the youngest of five, but everyone lived with a disability. Everyone. I had a sister who would go between crutches and a wheelchair. My brother, he kept flying to Boston to this fancy place called the Leahy Clinic for something called Crohn's. Why don't I get to travel? Every member of my family even had glasses, and I didn't. I would go to the eye doctor, and I am not making this up. I would read the chart, not in that room, probably the next room, but I'd pretend I couldn't see it, because I wanted glasses, just like everybody else had something. So imagine the surprise for me, growing up, coming out into the world, and discovering something a little bit different. And it really posed the question, where is everyone learning about disability? And frankly, is it stigmatizing us? And the answer is, really boils down to four ways we learn about disability. And all my research has really proven this. And the first way is as kids from our family. Come on, who remembers crazy cousin Louie? You know, and I'm sure we learned lots about crazy Uncle Louie, stay away from him. And then of course the schoolyard. You know, everyone's making fun of the kid in the tree. I'm not saying I was the kid, and I'm not saying there was a tree, but there was a kid in a tree being made fun of. Trust me. So is it surprising as we grow up and start watching CSI and Law and & Order and Joey kidnap poor little Timmy and Joey happens to be bipolar? Well, of course, what are we going to think? And then we've got, of course, the best of all, media. We don't get reports on the bipolar guy who has five kids, a job, and is living well. He's got to cut someone's head off just to get into the news. So why would we expect ourselves not to be stigmatized by that information? And of course, being an action person, my next question is, what are we doing about it? Well, I need to explain to you a very important sh paradigm shift that frankly, we're right in the midst of. There is something called a medical paradigm, which is how we used to define disability as a whole. People are broken, they require fixing. That's the medical paradigm. Now, the social paradigm, which is starting to really take over, and the fact that I'm here today talking about it only proves that, the social, or what I like to call the human rights paradigm, is where we all have value, we all should be accommodated, and there's nothing special about it. It's about equalizing the playing field. So, for me, 
Growing up, although I hadn't been identified as someone living with ADHD until I was an adult, I still had some very basic commonalities to deal with. First and foremost, you may not know this, but ADHD is comorbid, which is an ugly word for comes with, comes with mental health. The more severe on the ADHD spectrum, the more mental health you're going to be coping with. In my case, it's anxiety and depression, and I have to manage that. I also, you'll see a lot of other people, but in my case, you'll really see I'm very impulsive. You say, let's go, I'm there. I don't even know where I went, I'm just there. Competitive, get ready. I, no one will play Scrabble with me, which is a little bit of a personal problem. But here's the deal. When my doctor tested me as an adult, she sat me down after this battery of tests, and she said, Tova, and oh my God, the way she looked at me, I thought for sure I was a goner. She goes, Tova, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And she was this very specialized doctor in ADHD, and she said, you are the most severe on the ADHD spectrum I have ever tested. And I went, I'm first! (laughs) And I'm not kidding when I say to you, I went home smiling. They couldn't believe I was so happy because I was the best of the worst. Or is it the worst of the best? I don't know, but I won. So I was happy. I don't know. Everybody else seemed to be depressed. Now, I do have a short-term memory problem, which is part of the reason I use these slides. They're not just for me and you. They're for all of us. But I have to be honest, I can use them. Now, school days, I could go on forever, but I'm going to save you since they've only given me 15 minutes, which in my world is about three and a half to a mere mortal, because I like to talk. But okay, let's get to the uh uh-oh moments. School was not a good situation for a kid with severe ADHD. First of all, in primary, I remember that first day. I walked into the classroom. It it was a basement, but it had lots of windows, and it was really brightly lit. And you know, it wasn't so bad. I was scared, because I was a scared kid, just like I'm a scared adult, probably. But I was scared, and I went in, and I thought, this isn't bad. They even had a door in the corner where I could get out the back and actually see my mom parked there. So it was kind of cool. Then someone grabbed my hand and walked me into the next room. Now, same windows. I swear to God, half the wattage. Darkest room I was ever in. No door. And I went, I'm in a box. No, literally, I'm in a box. And that was called stupid primary. At least that's what I called it. And I knew immediately at five years old, they thought there was something wrong with me, and they put me in the dark room. And I, that's what I called it. Now, grade three... They tried the award, you know, the award that doesn't exist, from stick men to hangman, I got an art improvement award. Then, uh, that didn't work. So then in grade six, they just held me back. And from then on, you know, it wasn't great. And I'd love to talk to you about high school, but I would rather take one moment of your time and ask everyone listening to me today to consider when you or someone you loved was bullied, because whatever story I tell you, it won't be as impactful as the one you already have. And going through school being different, you already know, it's no fun. But here's the deal, and this is what makes me nuts. It's so ridiculous. The paradox is, everyone here today will have had, has at this moment, or will have a disability. So who in God's name are we stigmatizing? And until I was able to understand that self-stigmatization was my biggest problem, I couldn't be all that I could be. Today, I tell my sisters I use my powers for good. They get it, because I use them them for so much good. But the point is, by knowing who I am, and by having a toolbox, whatever that means, a personal toolbox, whether that's medication, therapy, a whiteboard, it doesn't matter. We have to identify who we are, accept it, remove the stigma, and as a result, I can share with you right now my top five superpowers. Number one. Some people call it hyperfocus. I don't like that word. A great psychologist came up with the word flow because people on the ADHD spectrum have a capacity to get so focused on something, they can become literally one with it. Now, some people must say that's terrible. My husband hates it. He's always like, Tova, 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 and I'm in there. But the thing is, I get things done in a way that's so quick and so efficient. If I can just get in that zone, I'll give you another great superpower that I think I have. Multitasking. My brain can't just do one thing. In fact, when there's a little emptiness in that brain of mine and I start drifting, I have what I actually call my backup brain list, which tells me things I should be thinking about instead of wasting my time wondering if Angelina Jolie really wore that dress that high. I mean, whatever. I keep myself on task by having lots of things to do. Now, I know what my mother said, no means not yet. 
But in my world, no means, I'm sorry, no really did mean no, but for me, it means not yet. And let me tell you why. Now remember, I'm working in funding, so I get no 40 times a day. But I honestly believe that no truly does mean not yet. Because until that ink is dry, I can't believe it. It's part of my thinking. I can't believe it. So uh, no means not yet, and if you're in my study group, you're gonna love it, because I'm gonna be back there trying to get an answer on why they think it's no. Now, fresh perspective. I love food, get ready. Imagine a salad, and it's only got lettuce. How interesting is that salad? How much diversity is that salad? Give me some onions, give me a couple radishes, some celery, tomatoes. Now you've got a salad, and each unique item is like a fresh perspective. But in order to achieve all of this at the level I can achieve it, I first had to care less. And I don't mean caring less about people. I mean caring less about what people thought and being able to be genuine and being able to offer everything I can to be able to move from being a stigmatized person to literally a superstar. And that's how I feel. Now, part of my food theme, I wanted to give you a takeout menu today. And it really does have three items. My mother once told me this story. When she lost her voice, you know, I always remember, because we would always try to make it easier for her to communicate with us, before she had that nice little servox and sounded, sounded like Stephen Hawking. I always tell her, you sound smarter now anyway. And she said to me, Tova, don't pretend you understand what I'm saying, because that means what I'm saying is not important enough to you to take the time. And that, my daughter, is removing my dignity. So the hell with political correctness, I couldn't do it anyway, but dignity, how do we do that? By staying curious and being able to say the words, I don't know. I remember when I lived in New York, and that's not why I'm like this, it's the ADHD, but I remember when I lived in New York, and in New York, you ask someone for directions, everyone says the same thing. Some go left, go straight, whatever, but no one ever says the words, I don't know. We need to stay curious and genuinely ask, and genuinely say, I don't know much about you. If we're going to be working together in a team, studying together, whatever it is, I need to stay curious to get the most out of you. And the third takeout item is the good news. Inclusion is win, win, win. For those of you who have ever read Stephen Covey, he had two wins. No offense, but I think three's right. Now, the three is simple. Obviously, you or whoever you're working with wins as a person who brings in diverse perspectives and utilizes and invites those superpowers as part of the bigger picture. Obviously, the person with disability like myself wins to work with you, to be given the freedom to bring all of the wonderfulness that I can come up with and you can come up with and make it something great. And the third win, which is the most important of all, is everyone on this planet because that creative force, that inclusive creative force is gonna change this world. And that's what it's all about, making it better. And what three magnificent wins could that be? We're all in. Now, I did want to remind you that I obviously feel this way, and you might have picked that up already, but I think weird is wonderful. And Frank Zappa said it, but I thought I said it first. But okay, we'll give it to him since I found him saying it too. But I never set out to be weird. It was other people who said I was weird. After all, you know, really, what is normal? I'm not sure. You can bet I'm not sure. And I'd like to invite everybody who feels they are normal to please stand up. I'm going to sit down. Yeah, that's what I figured. No one stood up. I happen to agree with you. I don't know what normal is. To me, normal is a setting on the dryer. So I just want to wrap up by saying, if you need to reach me, you can honk for help. I'll listen. And I'm Tova Sherman. And thank you so much for giving me some time today. Appreciate it.